Good morning again. Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8? Okay, we're going to be starting in, in Luke chapter 8, six, verse 16, and we're just going to go down to the 25th verse. Um, basically, this is a continuing thought from what we've just been studying. We studied about the parable of the sower, and you might remember those four soils. We said there were four kinds of hearts that individuals have. You've got the hard heart, so when the seed of the word is thrown out onto the hard heart, that person does not believe, they don't understand, and they will not receive that seed. So therefore, it cannot grow in that heart. So this is a complete unbeliever. That's one heart. The next heart is the shallow soil. So it goes into soil on rocky places, very shallow, where in the morning, it's got warmth, it's got a little bit of moisture, but by the time the afternoon rolls around, the sun comes out, that plant which has grown up then begins to wither away and it becomes like a tumbleweed flowing, <laughs> rolling down the road. That is a person who receives the word of God initially with great joy, but then when tribulation or trials come because of the word, because they're Christians, they fall away and they don't walk with God anymore. The third kind of heart is the mixed heart. That's the heart of a person that receives the word of God, but then it's also mixed in with a lot of other values. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things come crowding in and choke that seed so that it does not bear fruit. And that, quite frankly, is where most of the Western church is in right now, is in that third soil. The cares of this world come in and crowd out the word of God and, and choke it so that it doesn't bear fruit. But we want to be those in the fourth soil, the fourth kind of heart, which is the good and noble heart that receives the word of God with gladness and listens to it, obeys it, believes it, and does it. And that's the kind of heart that we want to have. It produces a, a, a crop 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown into it. That is abundant, miraculous kind of growth. So that's what he was just speaking about in the first 15 verses of Luke chapter 8. Now we get into Luke chapter 8, verse 16, and this is a continuing thought and sort of a deeper application of what he has just said. So look what he says here. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore take heed how you hear, for whoever has to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. Now, I brought with me a lamp, an oil lamp. This is what you can get in Israel. Uh, this is what they basically had in varying sizes back in the day that he was talking about. This is a lamp. And so you put the oil in here, you light it here, the oil comes up the wick, and it lights up your room. Now, what he's saying is it's not natural for you to light this lamp and then stick it under a basket or under a bed. It doesn't make any sense. You don't do that. When you light a lamp, you stick it up so that it can light up the whole room. Now, Jesus made an interesting comment in John chapter 1, verse 4. Actually, this is not Jesus. This is about Jesus. This is John speaking about him. It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when Jesus comes into our life, when we're born again of the Spirit of God, and his word comes into us, 
suddenly he lights a flame in us and he wants us to burn that flame brightly for all to see. He doesn't want us to hide the light that he's put inside. It doesn't make any sense for us to do that any more than it would make any sense to light this and stick it under a bushel or under a bed. So this is what he's saying. Now, notice that. It says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. That's in John chapter 1, verse 5. The darkness does not overcome it or comprehend it. So light always conquers darkness. You don't go over and, and have a, a switch on the, on the wall that, that says darkness. And, you know, it's light and you just flip the switch and suddenly it's, it's dark. The light has to go out for the darkness to appear. The light always conquers the darkness. So having said that, the only way that our light that Jesus has put in us can be hidden is if we do it ourselves. If we stick it underneath a basket or underneath a bed. Now it's interesting that he uses those two illustrations. The vessel or the basket is a unit of measurement for business. So think about that. Somebody goes to a market and they've got this basket. Now they bring it home and they use that basket and cover their lamp doesn't make any sense, but let's say they do it. He says, nobody would do that. Nobody does that. So think about this. If we hide our light by being so busy in business, we've extinguished the light that Jesus has put in us. And if we hide our light under our bed, that would speak perhaps of being lazy. I'm not going to do it, you know. Or we might use lame excuses like, hey, I don't have the gift of evangelism. It's just not my thing, you know? Well, we may not have the gift of evangelism like Austin or like some others that do, but we're all called to evangelize. We're all called to share our faith and to shine the light. So whether it's too busy in business or whether it's just pure laziness, those are ways that we perhaps can dampen the light that God has given us and hide it. Jesus said this in in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds, your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. So he says, let it shine. Let it out. Let it go. Let it shine before people so that they can see your good deeds and they glorify God who's given you this light. So this is what we want to be doing. Now, look in verse 17. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. In other words, the word of God, again, is not meant to be kept secret. The gospel is given for not just a select few, not just for us, but for the whole world. Jesus said in the Great Commission that he wanted us to go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples of all the nations and baptizing them and teaching them and all that. So we're to go everywhere. We're to shine the light in all these places. And we are responsible for the knowledge that we have been given by God. So when he teaches us, when we study the word, when we understand it, there comes with that a responsibility then to share it with other people. It's a sad thing when there are Christians who are very content to go to heaven alone. But that's not the way we should be. We should immediately want to share the gospel, share the faith, share the word with other people all around us, in our families, workplaces, communities, wherever we go. We should be concerned about the eternal destiny of every person around us because of love. And so we're responsible for what we know. Now, Paul said it like this. He said... Let a man so consider us, this is 1 Corinthians 4, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found, what's the next word? Faithful. So when you've been given a trust, a steward, somebody has been given a trust, something valuable to look after, and the gospel, the word of God is valuable, he says, You need to be faithful in executing that trust. 
He goes on in that chapter to say, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. So he says during this time there is going to be a judgment on how we have executed the trust that we've been given. We've, been, we've received truth, we've received knowledge, now we need to be able to share it with other people. So, we're to be stewards, is what he's saying. And then in verse 18, he says, Therefore take heed, notice, how you hear. Not necessarily what you hear, although that is important, but how you hear what you hear. So, we want to be those who are Believing on the word, we want to be those who are acting on the word. We want to be those who are sharing the word of God. This is how we should be hearing. He says, for whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away from him. Do you remember the parable of the talents? Where when Jesus... uh, He talks about a man who was going off to a far country to, to inherit a kingdom and to come back... And he gave his servants one talent each to these three servants. And when he came back, the first servant came and he says, Master, your talent has made ten more. And he says, well done, you'll be made ruler over many cities in my kingdom. And the next one came and says, Master, your, your talent gained five more. He used that talent and did something with it. He says, well done, you'll be made ruler over five cities. And then the last guy came and he says, Master, your talent... Here it is. I give it back to you. I didn't do anything with it. And he said, well, take away that one talent that that guy has and give it to the one who has ten. And and they said, Master, he's already got ten. And he says, the same thing that Jesus is saying here. Whoever has, more will be given. But whoever does not have, in other words, who who hasn't used what he's had, even what he seems to have will be taken away from him. So this is what he's talking about regarding the information, the knowledge of God, the truth of his word that we receive, we need to use it. There's a real responsibility for you who are sitting here, for us who read the word. You know, if you go into some of these um, foreign countries, do missionary work, they'll have one Bible for an entire group of people this big, and they'll have to share that out. And they'll, they'll, they'll give it out to various people to take home, to study it, and to Uh, and to memorize it. I've got multiple Bibles in my own house. You probably do too. We've we've got a glut of Bibles and knowledge here in this nation. And there's a responsibility for that. You know, we want to be able to do something with the information, the knowledge of God that we've been given. So he talks about how we hear. Now, I want to give you three ways that you can hear properly. Take heed how you hear. Number one is this. Hear with faith. Hear with faith. So, if I can get this thing to work. Um, In 1 Thessalonians, no, sorry, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. He says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with, with faith in those who heard it. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So when we hear the word, we have to mix it with faith. Those Jews who were there um, at Kadesh Barnea, who heard the word about going up to take the land of promise, they didn't believe it. And so they wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness and died. We need to mix the word of God with faith. Can you, can you um, do these things? Yeah, this, this thing is not working properly. Thank you. The next thing is, we need to hear the word of God with reverence. We need to recognize that the word of God is actually the word of God. You know, we don't, we don't just come to this book like we do any other book. It's different. It's a, it's a holy book. Now, I take my Bible and I, 
I make notes in it and I mark it down because I'm trying to understand it and gather knowledge to bless my soul. But this book is holy. You know, I need to know, hey, this is God speaking to me. It's his word to my own heart. The eternal God is speaking. This is what the Thessalonians said, um, or they did when the word of God came to them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, I'll read it. Uh, for, without, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. When Paul came to preach to them, they heard the word and they said, that's the word of God. They knew it immediately and they, they reverenced it. And that's the way we ought to be. Hearing it with faith, number one, but hearing it with reverence, number two. And then finally, we need to hear it prayerfully. We need to hear it prayerfully. We need to pray when we come to the word of God. Oh God, open my heart. Help me see wonderful things in your word. God, by your spirit, be my teacher this morning. I know that Doug is teaching, but ultimately, it's you, Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. You're the one. You lead us into all truth. So we need to be prayerful. We need to be prayerful when we're in our quiet times. We need to be prayerful when we're coming to church. You know, the time before the service starts, when we all just gather in here, maybe you could just come in and bow your head and just say, Lord, would you bless this service to my hearing? Help me to receive the word of God. Help me to worship you. And just get your heart prepared for the word. Bible knowledge comes with responsibility. That's why James said, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you will receive a stricter judgment. You see, I'm in the word of God all the time preparing to teach you. I'm going to be judged stricter than, than you will be on the day of judgment because I've had all of this access to Bible commentaries and different things. But whatever level of Bible knowledge you have, you're responsible to use that. This is what he's saying. Well, the thought might come into someone's mind then. Well, if that's the case, then ignorance is bliss. It'd be better not to know the word of God. No, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is darkness. The world is in a dark place. The world does not know God. They don't have the hope of God. But we do. When we open the word of God, it's like light into our souls. Ignorance is not bliss. Knowing God is bliss. That's what it's all about. And so, you know, in the scriptures and in our relationship with God, we can go as deep with God as we want to go. God says here, Jesus says, to whoever has, to him more will be given. If you study the word, if you apply it to your life, God's going to give you more. If you act on the light that you've been given, God will give you more light. You can go as deep with God as you want to go. And the blessings are just incredible. You know, closeness with God, strength, power, joy, peace, assurance, faith, wisdom from God, all of those things can be yours. It's bliss. Some people, I think, are, are bored of Scripture because they don't know enough. They haven't gone deep enough. If you're feeling that way in your Scripture reading, if you think, oh, this is just boring, it's not because you've got too much of the Bible, it's because you don't have enough. Just keep going deeper with Him and the treasures are boundless. Well, look now into the next section here. Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So again, we have this thing about listening, not just to hear it, but, but actually to obey it, to do it, believe in it. Now, this little section here teaches us a few things. Number one, Mary had other children. Now, if you have a Catholic background, I've got a, a little Catholic background, they teach about the perpetual virginity of Mary. So Mary 
had Jesus, but then she remained a virgin until she died. Well, here it talks about Mary came uh, with his brothers. We know from Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says there that Mary came with four sons and at least two daughters. So it talks about sisters. So Jesus had at least six siblings, four brothers and at least two sisters. So she wasn't a perpetual virgin, according to the word of God. Um, Second thing is, Mary doesn't appear to have fully grasped the nature of Jesus and his mission. You know, it tells us in another gospel account about this, that the townspeople from Nazareth, along with Mary and his brothers, came to him and they thought he was crazy. What What are you doing? And they tried to get into the room where he was. She didn't quite grasp this whole thing. Now, she didn't know that she was going to have to share him with the whole world. See, Jesus wasn't just her son. He was the Savior of the world. He was God's son that was given for the life of all humanity. And do you remember when um, Mary and Joseph went up to dedicate Jesus at the temple? It was Simeon who came and said, you know, He's going to be for the rising and fall of many in Israel, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I think this is one of those swords that pierced her soul where, man, I'm, I'm trying to get to my son, but, but here he says, even these people around me, if they obey the word of God, are my brother, my mother, and my sister. You know, they're my family. I think that was probably painful, but it was necessary for the life of all mankind. But I think the third thing that we see in this section is simply this, that closeness to Jesus is based on obedience to his word and not on blood relationship. You know, here's Mary and his brothers coming to Jesus, but the crowd had kept them away. There is no crowd in the world that can keep us away from Jesus Christ, spiritually. No physical human being can keep us from him. Because spiritually, if we obey his word, we are as close to him as we want to be. It's amazing. Jesus said this in in John 14, verse 21. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's a great promise. He says, look, if you keep my word, if you obey what I'm saying to you, then you show that that you love me, and I will love you, and I will manifest myself to you. I will come to you. I will reveal myself to you. That's what I love about the the scriptures. The scriptures are axiomatic. They're self-evident. In other words, when you do what it says, Jesus Christ reveals himself to you. And so if you want to know God better, just obey what he says for you to do. So no crowd can keep you from Jesus. You can can get as close as you want to him uh, any place you go. So a few weeks back, I was up in London. I'm on the tube, thousands of people around. And what do I do just in the midst of it? I just sit down and I just begin to pray. And I'm right there with the Lord. No problem. This morning, I'm down eating breakfast on my dining room table. And I bow and I pray. I'm right there, nobody around, but I'm with Jesus. I go out to Ashburnham. I go into the prayer center and I can be with Jesus. I can go out in my car and I can be with Jesus. You know, you can be with Jesus anywhere, anytime. doesn't matter who's around you, how many people, or how few people. You can be right there. So wonderful. My mother and my brothers, he says, are those who hear the word of God and do it. And now finally, in verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, 
and they were filling with the water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he even commands, he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. The remaining verses in chapter 8 speak of the power of Jesus over nature, which we've just read here, over demons, over sickness or disease, and over death. It talks about tremendous power, but it also talks about the faith that we need in order to release that power of God into our lives. This is really important for us because we need to trust in him and trust in his word in order for that power to come into our lives and to, to make it applicable to us. And so here he is. He's on um, the Sea of Galilee and this huge storm comes up. Now, I want to give you a bit of the geography of the Sea of Galilee. Um, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and 8 miles wide at its widest point. It's 700 feet below sea level. It is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. And surrounding the Sea of Galilee on all sides are canyons, some of them quite high, or the, the mountains there, and then the canyons come through there. And because it's below sea level, you get these winds that swoop down from the canyons onto the Sea of Galilee, and it can make storms come up very rapidly, very quickly. I have a few photographs I want to show you from um, my last time there in, in Israel. So this is, this is looking from the Sea of Galilee. We were on a boat and looking at the seashore, and this is actually the, the place where Jesus met with the disciples in John chapter 21 and um, restored Peter to the ministry. So it's right there at that place. Let's go on to the next slide. Now right there is what's called the Valley of the Doves. And that leads all the way up to Nazareth. And on the left side of that is Mount Arbel. And so um, this is a photograph from Mount Arbel looking down. Now you notice over here, there's a C-130 transport plane from the, uh, can you see it there? That's below that level, going through the Valley of the Doves. So it's, a, it's an Israeli Air Force plane. These, the, the winds come swooping down there and can make, make the seas go really mad. So this is a little video of it. So it gets pretty strong. That's good. Thank you. So you get a chance to see that when you go to Israel with us next year. Um, but it was so intense that the disciples began to freak out. Now, bear in mind that a lot of these guys were fishermen. They'd been on this lake a lot. They understood how rough it could be, and they were still freaking out. But you notice what the command was. Oh, by the way, um, this storm that rose up on this lake, on the Sea of Galilee, many commentators believe that this could have been a direct work of Satan. Not just the winds coming down, not just something natural, but a direct work of the enemy who has power, we know from the book of Job, over nature in a lot of ways. Um, and the reason they believe that is because in verse 24, Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves and that word rebuked is the same word he used to rebuke demons in Luke chapter 4, twice. So it could be that the enemy, Satan, saw Jesus and the disciples in this boat. He said, I'm going to take them out. And Jesus stands up and he rebukes it. Everything's calm. But these men began to freak out. Now notice in verse 22 what Jesus had said to them. He said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. Now, in those words, you have both a command and a promise. The command is, we're going to go over. The promise is, we're going to make it. 
And if Jesus says, we're going to the other side, it means that you're not going to go under. And one thing that these guys failed to do was appropriate by faith these words of Jesus, the simple word of God. They didn't take it into their heart. They didn't believe. Now, in verse 23, as they're going out, it says, he fell asleep. Now, this speaks of his humanity, doesn't it? Luke, being a doctor, was focused a lot on the humanity of Jesus. Jesus got tired, just like you and I get tired. Jesus was tired in the ministry. He was tired in the work. He was not tired of the work. And there's a big difference there. Being tired in the work, if you're serving God, serving Him in your family, serving Him at church, serving Him at work, you might get tired and you need rest. But if you're tired of the work, there's a big problem. There's a big problem. You're, you're becoming like Martha's. You're so busy in the ministry that you neglect time with God and you're tired of the work instead of being tired in the work. Let's keep that, that balance. So this speaks of his humanity. He got tired. He was both God and man in one person, 100% of both, 100% man, 100% God. Now, why did he become, by the way, as an aside, why did he become a man? Why did he add humanity to his deity? Because he always was God before he became a man. Why did he add a human nature? Well, it was simply to die in our place. Because we needed a perfect substitute for us to die on that cross for our sins. Animals couldn't do it. Only the blood of a human being, Jesus Christ, could do it. Only the blood of a perfect human being. So, uh, would you put up there Hebrews 2.14? Inasmuch then as the children have become flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So he became a man in order to destroy death in our lives and the power of death over us. So the wages of sin is death. Every single one of us has committed sin. The penalty for that is death. Jesus came in to pay the death penalty that we could be forgiven. And so these guys, when Jesus is there asleep in the back of the boat, and I, I just picture this in my mind, how funny it would be. He's just snoozing. And they're, they're trying to keep this all together, you know, and it's just fasting. And he's no problem whatsoever for him. He can sleep through that. I think about the peace of a person that can sleep in the midst of a storm. Don't you want that in your own heart when storms of life are around you? And you can just, it's okay, God's got it, no problem. We're making it to the other side. <laughs> Well, they begin to, to get, get worried, and they, they woke him up saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and notice, and they ceased, and there was calm. Now, they were looking with the eyes of their physical eyes. They were looking with human eyes at the storm that was all around them. What they needed to do was see with the eyes of faith. Because when you see with the eyes of faith, it doesn't really matter what you see with your physical eyes. <clears throat> you know that God's going to take care of you. He's going he's to help you through whatever you're facing. J.C. Ryle said this, It is only true, too true that sight and sense and feeling make men very poor theologians. If you're relying just on your physical senses, often you can... Just forget about the promises of God. You forget that God is with you, that he's going to help you. He said, we're going over to the other side of the lake. And if he said that, it means they weren't going to go under. We're going to be reading in a couple weeks' time about David um, and Abiathar, one of the priests. Well, a man named Doag the Edomite came and killed all of Abiathar's family. And Abiathar went and found David. 
And David made these, this amazing statement to Abiathar. He said, stay with me, do not fear, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, but with me you shall be safe. With me you shall be safe. I, I, I see that because David saw himself as being the anointed of God, he knew that God had his hand on his life, that he was going to be the king someday. He says, stay with me. This guy's trying to kill me, but in, with me, you've got safety. And I see in this a picture of Jesus Christ. Look, the enemy is after Christ. He's after you if you're a Christian. And Jesus says, hey, he's after me. He's trying to kill me, but with me, stay with me. You'd be safe. You see, Jesus was in their boat. They didn't have to worry. Jesus is in your life, your boat, so to speak. You don't have to worry. He's going to take care of you. He's going to help you when all the seas, all the trials, all the storms of life come up. He's going to help you through. Notice immediately what Jesus does. He stands up. He rebukes the wind and the, and the waves. And it says, and they ceased and there was a calm. Now, you know, you can, you can stop wind from blowing, but the seas will still be churned up for quite some time. When Jesus did this, the wind stopped and the sea immediately went calm. I imagine it was just glassy calm like that photograph I showed you before. Just like that. Jesus can do that. If he can do that here in nature, well, he can do it in your own heart. You ever get stirred up like that? You ever get anxious and just worried? You get worried about your finances. You get worried about your children. You get worried about your family. You get worried about work. You get worried about the government. You get worried about Brexit. You get worried about the England team. You get worried about Liverpool. You get worried about all of these things. We get worried. Fears just come rushing in. And Jesus can immediately go, be still, be calmed, and just like that. Now, he can do that in our own hearts, even if everything around us is still going crazy. Because what was he doing? He was still sleeping in the, he was in the boat when it was all going nuts. He already had it. He was sleeping. And he was calm. Sometimes when we pray, we pray, God, change everything else outside of me, then I'll be happy. I'll be calm. I'll be peaceful. And God says, I, I'll give you a better thing. I will calm your own heart in the midst of all of this. How's that? Okay. And he may or may not change what's on the external. But he can certainly do that in an instant in our heart. He can make everything smooth out and give us peace. I remember reading in, you remember Tom Hamlin who came here a couple years ago, great brother, older guy, was a Bible courier into Muslim nations. Well, one time he got arrested, was put into prison in one of these Muslim nations for, for sharing the word of God. And the uh, one of the ambassadors from the British embassy there came and spoke to him and he said, how are you doing? Um, first of all, he said, do you need any soap for some reason? You know, you're British, you got to stay clean. You know, do you need any soap? And he says, no, I'm fine. I've got soap. He says, how are you doing? And he said, I feel perfect at, at, perfectly at peace. And that guy says, what? I'm at perfect peace. I'm right in the center of God's will. No problem. God's going to take care of me. God got him out. All the Bibles were saved. They were all distributed to the Christians in these nations. God just did it. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, He will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace, him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trusting in the Lord. You know, all of that power that Jesus had to still the storm he makes all of that power available to every single one of his children in order to save them from any trial that they go through he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him by faith he'll pour out all of that power to help us the bible says he who is in us is greater than what he who is in the world James just read when we opened the service, John chapter 16, verse 33. 
In the world, you will have tribulation. It's guaranteed. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Cheer up. Cheer up. Think about this. You are guaranteed that outside of the the walls of this church and outside of your own heart, there's going to be trials, tribulation, difficulty, storms. But he says, cheer up. Don't be bummed out about that. Smile because I have overcome the world. I'm with you. I'm going to take care of it. In verse 25, he said to them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? And that's a good question, isn't it? Where is your faith? You know, we exhibit faith all the time. When you get up in the morning, you flip the light switch on, you just immediately have faith that that the power is going to go to the light and it's going to come on. Somebody hands you a cup of coffee, you have faith in your spouse that they haven't put arsenic in your coffee. You get, on a taxi, you get in a taxi, you have faith that the driver's going to get you where you need to go, a bus, you take a plane. You know, you're, you're putting your trust in all of these things. We are all trusting right now that the chairs that you're sitting in are going to hold you up. You probably didn't think about that too much, but you, you put faith in it. We're putting faith in the builder who built this thing in 1912 that this roof is not going to come collapsing down on us. We've got, we're using faith all the time. He says, where is your faith? If we can exhibit faith in all of these other things, is it really so hard for us to put our faith in God's word, in what he said to us? He wants us to keep, keep trusting him. Numbers 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. <clears throat> Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? If God's promised us, we need to exhibit faith and trust in it and apply that to our life. And that's when the power of God comes in. You see, what good is the word of God if we don't use the word of God? What good is a sword, if you're a soldier, if you don't use the sword? The sword is not meant for the parade ground. It's not meant to just fling it around, you know, and say, look what I know. You need to use it. It's meant for the battleground. So when difficulties and trials and storms and the enemy comes into your life, that is the time to use what you know. You've got to use that word. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, remember those three great temptations at the end of 40 days of fasting? He always responded, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's how he defeated the enemy, with the sword of the word of God. We've got to use it too. I think, in closing, some of us, and I'm going to make this personal, some of you have faith that Jesus Christ can save you from sin. But you don't have faith enough to believe that Jesus Christ can save you from your heating bill or some other payment that you have to give out. You have faith that Jesus Christ is going to get you to heaven, but in the meantime, you're, you're living a very worried life. Jesus said in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, What shall we say to this, these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things. Look, if Jesus didn't withhold his own son, well, he's going to give you everything that you need for life and godly living. He wants you to live a joyful Christian life, totally in faith, trusting him. Matthew 4, 19, Paul says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Some of you have faith enough in Jesus to save you from your sins, but you don't have faith that Jesus can save your children, your own kids. Psalms 138 verse 8 says, 
that he will perfect that which concerns me. God cares about the things that concern you and me. He loves us. He takes those personally, and he'll make it right. And some of you have faith that Jesus can save you from the guilt of sin, but you don't have faith that Jesus can actually save you from the power of sin. You see, you know that you're going to heaven, you're forgiven for the things, but actually to overcome a besetting sin in your life, man, I just can't get over this thing. You know what? Jesus can help you get over it. He's got power to help you break sin in your life. Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. Philippians 2.13 He is working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He gives us the, the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. And then Romans 6.14 he says, for you, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Sin is no longer your master. God's breaking that in your life every single day. And maybe some of you here this morning have never actually trusted in Jesus Christ to begin with to save you from your sins. And as we are going to pass out the communion elements and take communion, this is a time when we look back to what Jesus did at the cross and we remember the great death that he died for us, that our sins can be forgiven. And so I want to give you this opportunity right now to receive Christ into your life and come and share in this meal, which is a family meal. We're to examine ourselves. You know, are we in the faith? Are we walking with God? Is there anything that we need to confess to him? And then we can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and free to partake of this meal. So as I just close in prayer now, if, if you're not a Christian here today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you can come then after that and take communion. So let's, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this time of communion that we're going to take now. When we remember your death on the cross, thank you, Jesus, that you didn't just stay in heaven, but you left the glories of heaven to come to this earth to die that horrible death to suffer the wrath of God on our behalf, that we might be forgiven. And I want to pray for anyone here this morning who needs to receive you, that right now, right here in this place, they would do it. And if that's you this morning, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I turn from them, and I turn to you. I ask you to make me your child. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life and break the power of sin. And I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose for me, and I want to live according to that plan and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.